Good evening out there in the hinterlands, near and far, far away. There's Mark Benzel out of Anacortes, Washington. How hey, are you, Mark. Peter? It's Doing been well. a month and we're back on. Yeah, season three. That's right. Hi, Landon. Welcome back. Hi, there. Firma. Back from your expedition out to Alaska. Excited to hear all the details there and what it's been like to get back. But yeah, we're delighted to have a big show in store tonight. We've got the Anacortes Yacht Charters proprietor, Mike Lavelle, joining us in a little bit. But so, Mark, what have you been up to recently in the last month or so? Did you grow your hair out a little bit? I, I did grow it out <laughs> just a little bit. Anything will help. Thank you for noticing, Peter. Yeah, sure. Uh, hey, I get I it. Was out I get it. This weekend <laughs> also, and uh, I had I had some engine problems. I'm not afraid to admit that happens to me too. And and uh, on uh, Monday afternoon, while coming back to Anacortes, out in the middle of the channel, uh, my both engines died, and I called my handy boat US and uh, uh, drifted in the current for about five miles. And then the, the uh, tow uh, driver came out, took me back to my marina, but I'm having some fuel issues I have to deal with uh, and uh, take care of. So it happens to me too. Uh, luckily it's never happened on my trips to Alaska, but, uh, but it was very interesting to be out at Roche Har Harbor. They did a fantastic job as always. I can say that, uh, they didn't quite have as many boats as they've had on past Labor Days. And I don't know whether people held back because of COVID, because of uh, worried about not being able to get reservations there. There was plenty of room. They could take all the boats that, that uh, were on standby. And, uh, but it was, uh, it was nice, nice to get away. Nice. So yeah, Mark Manzel, man of the people, feels our pain when we have engine problems. It's good to hear. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was all all of those boaters were staying and they knew you were going to have some problems with the engine so they stayed out of your way Everybody yeah they did. Right. they did well, they you, did you notice i'm now on the roche harbor staff mark so i, I could have i'm, I'm impressed with the hat uh, i don't know what you did to get a hat you well, probably as, tied up a boat or something as the bible says a knock and the door shall be open to you i think that's the bible verse but yeah troy buck hooked me up when we were up there a couple weeks ago i asked and he he delivered. So I was very appreciative of to get the hat and hopefully people won't be uh, complaining to me, you know, or like asking me for help or like directions, but I'm a faux staffer at Roche Harbor, apparently. And Landis, Good. welcome back to, to Washington state. What's it been like to be back for you? Well, it's been work. Uh, we labored on Labor Day. We exactly. thought that's what you're supposed to do. We're exactly. busy putting together the 528 page 2022 Wagoner Guides. So. Already started on that, got yeah. chapters done and ready to go. New stuff, all kinds of stuff. So we're busy. Yes, so we're Labor Day. So just so you all know where it goes to the printer on uh, just before uh, Halloween. And uh, so we're in our crunch mode as we go every year to pull all the pieces together and get all the updates in there. Lorena's got updates just about on every page of the book as she always does. And it's amazing how much has changed. And uh, 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 we can talk about this in another show, but the Broughtons is now completely different. And uh, it's lots of new maps. Leonard's our map guy, does all the new maps, revises, updates, and adds to that. Fantastic. It's one of the, I think, the main uh, niceties of the Wagoner. Boaters really appreciate having those maps with details that you don't always find elsewhere. Yes. Thank you, Leonard. You do a fantastic job with that. So, Peter, that's what we've been up to uh, in between uh, me breaking down, uh, working on the Wagner Guide and our advertisers and our updates. And it's going to be pretty exciting. Awesome. Well, that's great. Well, in, in the meantime, I, Mark, I now have glasses. 
since I was last on the show here. I went to the doctor and got some eyeglasses. I'm a little self-conscious about them, but I, I hope so you're you not wear wearing them, Peter. I know. Well, let me put them on for you one second. Yeah, oh, here they go. No. Okay. I, I think what we're being think? set like, up here. Yeah, all right. yeah, yeah. 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 No. Please don't laugh, please. Come on. Peter. No, I'm just kidding, of course. But no, here are my spectacles that uh, my mom approves of. Uh, they're the, the, I've also had the dark frames. Maybe I'll bring bust those out next week. But yeah, they, they look stylish. This was not All a right. joke. These are not the joke pair. Okay, Mark. So easy yeah. does it there. <laughs> uh, well, excellent. Well, yeah, and I've been busy on the on the uh, government affairs front. Uh, back in the saddle after a week boating uh, to Deer Harbor and Roche Harbor and Lopez, and then got back at it. And one of the big issues I've been working on, Mark and Landon's, is the C Seattle Harbor Patrol. So the Seattle City Council has really done a number on. Uh, gutting Seattle Police Department, and that includes the Seattle Harbor Patrol. So we put together an action alert that Seattle residents and non-residents can fill out. I will put that in the chat. We met with the mayor's office yesterday uh, as Mayor Durkin winds down her one and only term. Um, there's only so much they can do as what's called a lame duck mayor. So, uh, but they gave us some good advice and we've got an action. We've heard from about 75 voters thus far. That's not enough. So we're going to encourage everyone to weigh in as they can. So that's that's an issue. And then I'd, I'd say, uh, looks like we've got a win. Oh, no, I watched the Seattle Times. There's an op-ed that uh, I heard uh, someone whisper in my ear that it might be published in the next couple of days that we uh, had a finger uh, hand in writing. So looking forward to that. So check your Seattle Times. And then an issue that uh, looks like we've been victorious on is this depreciation schedule, big word, around excise taxes. Uh, so every year boaters pay an excise tax, which is uh, calculated by the value of your vessel. It hasn't been updated since like 15 years. Well, DOR, Department of Revenue, decided to update it this year of all years, go figure, because boating is more popular than ever. And they said that second year value of a vessel is about 97% of your boat's purchase price, which was crazy. So we uh, got them some data. We crunched some numbers, uh, looked at Washington Sea Grants numbers, and they have really readjusted, really hurt us, knocking on wood here. And it uh, looks like we're on the right path to keeping some more money in boaters' pockets so they can spend it on other fun stuff than taxes. So yeah, thank you, a couple Peter. Of, yeah, thank well, you. you can yeah. you can send those checks to Peter Trappen at uh, no. <laughs> uh, no, it's a fun issue. It's actually really uh, heartwarming to see agencies who get easy to lambast for them to listen and take our advice and do the right thing. I think we're on the right path there. So that's a quick little update for you all. That's fantastic. Glad you're back <laughs> back on it. It's just amazing how these things pop up like whack a mole. And all of a sudden, they're they're <laughs> reaching into your pocket, and you're you're on it and chasing it down. Yeah, I'd much, much rather be a Chuck E. Cheese as playing whack a mole, but this is, I guess, the second best thing. It doesn't pay as well, Mark, hanging out at Showbiz Pizza, but uh... I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my update, Landis. Do you have an update for us? Yeah. What do we have new that we need to share with everybody? Oh, we have a few things here. Um, you can now go to BC by ferry. Used to be you could not do that, but. Uh, Starting September 17th, Clipper Vacations will be doing their round trips from Seattle to Victoria. Uh, the Black Bow Ferry Line, however, will not be running between Victoria and Port Angeles until the U.S. border opens to Canadians. And of course, we know September 7th, a few couple days ago, that other foreign nationals can now go to Canada. Same rules must be fully vaccinated uh, do the uh, right can app come with a negative COVID test. And then a uh, few updates for marinas. Friday Harbor now has a garbage compactor behind the main office. No more dumpsters on the pier. And they're planning to put in new restrooms and showers. And they are taking reservations until September 15th. And uh, this is a reminder, of course, that marinas have limited uh, staff on the off season. They'll be starting their first come, first serve uh, basis. And that includes actually Deer Harbor right now is on a first come, first serve. So call them on channel seven, eight for space assignment. And let's see, we have uh, good news in Docton Park and Quartermaster Harbor. They are in their next phase of replacing docks. So the entire marina will be closed starting September 10 for an extended period of time while they put in new docks. 
So the good news is it's closed? Yeah, the good no. news is cool. they'll <laughs> have new dots, which is great. Okay. Quartermaster has needed that for a very long time. So yeah, they have. Uh, yeah, the park and the playground will be closed for three weeks starting September 10, as well as the marina. We're not sure how long it will take them to uh, put in the new docks, but uh, we have that to look forward to. And we have uh, a little update here, the CBP Rome app, the report arrival app the, for customs. They're upgrading that very soon here and that they'll now be including support for uh, Canadian voters to request their cruising license through CBP Rome. So you'll know, they'll no longer have to go into the CBP, uh, to a CBP office in order to get the cruising license. And there's also a statement that you'll be able to renew CBC, uh, the cruising license, which previously you were not able to do that. But we have not confirmed the renewal part, but uh, indeed they're gonna add that support to CBP Rome. And the other one regarding CBP Rome is that the Rome app is going to be replaced sometime in 2022 with CBP One, and that's just CBP One, CBP One. The app is already out there. It's been in use for quite a while here, about a year or so, for commercial uh, vessels and other, uh, I believe, air travel too. So it's been used for commercial purposes, commercial travelers. And they're going to add the uh, private boat support to it. And the word is that they're going to take away CBP Rome when they do that. It's not clear exactly how they're going to do that. Been asking, but haven't got the answer. And that's supposed to be ready for next year's uh, cruising season. That's again CBP One. You can download that app now, a free app. Uh, and again, uh, it will replace in the future CBP Rome, and it'll have a whole lot more functionality in it than the Rome app has right now. A couple of other notes, uh, or one other note here, the Whidbey Island, uh, this is off of Whidbey Island Naval Air Station. And uh, it's, the, it's a small arms safety zone. It's on your charts, but it's not a restricted area. It just has a note there that says it's a, CV, it's a small arms uh, safety area. And indeed, they're, they're doing a small arms fire somewhere uh, uh, from uh, Whidbey Island. Then the uh, safety zone extends out a half a mile. And again, not a restricted area, but I, I regularly get notices that it's active, like almost every day it's active. So just a reminder that goes out about a half a mile from shore. So if you're near that, uh, stay at least a half a mile out. And then just a couple of notes on uh, the on Alaska, Southeast Alaska and the cruising up there since uh, this season. And that was, first of all, it was a very welcome change for, the, for Alaskans from last year when there was no season at all. And uh, since, uh, we, uh, we ended up uh, up there about May 1st, and uh, it was a welcome change. There was, it was almost like uh, COVID hadn't been, hadn't been happening up there. Uh, by the, probably about the end of July, there was a little bit more lockdown, but uh, when they got some surges in cases up there. But they definitely rec uh, welcomed everybody. There was a noticeable increase in the, in the number of very large boats. So we noticed that uh, almost the mega yacht size stuff, uh, lots of them up there. And a lot of pocket cruise ships, the small ones, less than 100 passenger were up there. Uh, looks like they're up, everybody's set for next season. And uh, there was plenty of space this year and uh, should be plenty of space next year as they get things ready and open up for everybody. The other one, uh, the tribal communities up there, uh, nearly all of them were open. We didn't find much of anything that was closed. The only ones, the only two that we found that were, that simply said they preferred that we didn't show up was Kassan and Metlakatla, Alaska. But other than that, everybody else was open and everybody was, all the communities were welcoming us. Uh, a few of them asked for some, uh, for, for some COVID considerations or, or uh, you know, wear masks and that sort of thing. But everybody's open and it was great. It was a wonderful time. It was classic Alaska weather. Uh, it might start out sunny in the morning, yet uh, blast you with a whole bunch of rain by noon, and it might be sunny again in the afternoon. You never know, but it was wonderful. Great. Um, I just have uh, one or two announcements, and that's that uh, unfortunately, the Port Townsend Wooden Boat Festival, which would have started tomorrow, uh, is canceled uh, due to COVID uh, restrictions and COVID considerations. And then also in Anacortes, uh, Beer on the Pier, uh, which we talked about on this show, is also canceled this week. And that would have been, I believe, October 6th. Uh, and so uh, unfortunately, we're not going to have that. 
and uh, we're watching other cancellations. If you're making any plans to go, <coughs> excuse me, it's a good idea to, uh, to check ahead. Uh, and as Leonard said, we, uh, while out cruising around, we found a number of places had strange closures during the midweek uh, when they couldn't get enough staff. And so if you really have your heart set on a particular restaurant, call ahead, check in with them. They're not updating it, unfortunately, on their websites, but uh, you might want to check as to whether they're open on a particular date. And I think that's all the announcements we have for this week and, and updates. Hey, Mark, can you talk a little about the, uh, the Wooden Boat Festival and what happened there? One week it was on and we, everyone was all excited. The next week it was off. Do you have an inside track that you could share? Well, I, I do. Uh, I, I'm on the board of directors for the uh, Northwest Maritime Center. And uh, there was a lot of careful consideration of this because they really wanted to have the festival. Uh, it's important to the spirit of that organization. Financially, it's important. And uh, 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 they were concerned for the volunteers that work uh, the event. Uh, community people were concerned. And there were just too many concerns. Some participants that were planning to bring their boats there were pulling out of, of the show. And there's a pattern to this that we're finding. Uh, this, this was also the issue with the beer festival. A number of brewers called the Anacortes Chamber of Commerce and said, we're just not comfortable sending our people down. And so uh, uh, the Northwest Maritime Center made a determination that the event was not going to be up to the caliber of the kind of event that they wanted to put on. So it was the quality of the event, as well as safety considerations, that, that weighed heavily into that decision uh, to close that event. Thanks, so Mark. That, it's unfortunate. Uh, so uh, now we saw Seattle Boat Show in February, first week of February, is still planning on rolling forward. Boats afloat next week, uh, right now, is still planning on opening. That'll be next week in Lake Union. And we have been advised that if you're planning on going down to that event, uh, it, uh, it's going to be a little different. Uh, many of the restaurants around Lake Union are no longer open. So uh, it'll, uh, it'll be a little bit more difficult. Uh, I'm sure they'll have some other food accommodations, but uh, uh, it's gonna be a little bit different this year. Uh, so the word that I have it is uh, there's gonna be about 130, 140 boats on display. And uh, uh, from that standpoint, it should be a fun event to see what the brokers bring and new boats, uh, some of the new boats. So that's some things that are coming up and that boat show is still planned uh, for next week, starting next week. So you yeah. can uh, see that from our friends at uh, NYBA. Things have been went so quickly on that front too, the Mark, just on Tuesday by 1116, the King County had issued the, the mask and vaccination sort of rollout. So it's been really a, a good time to have a newspaper subscription and, and refreshing the Seattle Times, for example, or, or the, uh, the different papers around town, just to see what is going on and keep up with it all. It's good it's point. A, yeah. Good point. Good. What's on store then with Mike and the rest of the show? Well, we've got another exciting guest for you tonight. And uh, uh, Mike Lovell's with me. He's going to be joining me here in a second. Come on in, Mike. Hello, hello. And I, I've known Mike. I figured it out today in putting this together. I, I, we both live in Anacortes and obviously both in the boating business. And we connected early on, and it's been 19 years yeah. that we've known each other. That sounds about right. That's yeah. like half a, long a life, time. half a lifetime, or at least a third. Yeah. Uh, Mike uh, and his wife, Kristen, uh, own uh, Anacortes Yacht Charters, and he'll talk to you a little bit about the history of Anacortes Yacht Charters and, and some of the great things they're doing. And one thing that I determined a couple of years ago while doing an economic development study for uh, the city of Anacortes was we are actually, Anacortes and Bellingham, the second largest charter capital in the world. The first is a place that I know well, and, and Mike knows well also, is Tortola in the British Virgin Islands. Yes. But we have, uh, last count, over 300, 300? Yeah, 350-ish. Charter boats available of people who come in to visit 
take a boat out. They, they spend money in the area. They, they see the beautiful islands or go further. And Anacortes Yacht Charters is a huge part of that. And it has a fleet of uh, what, some 60 some Six, boats? 65, 70 boats. Sailboats, power boats, all sizes, yep. small as well as large. And uh, it's really a, a tremendous benefit. And this is how I got started boating up here. I used to work and live in Silicon Valley and come up every summer and charter a boat. And uh, look what happened to me. Now I live here <laughs> uh, and have made a career out of it. The same thing happened to us. We started when our sons were very young. We lived in Redmond, Kirkland area. When they were quite young, we would come to Anacortes every season, charter a boat. And uh, it was great because you could try out different brands. You could get the feel of how each boat handled. You could gain boating experience and you could bring the boat back and it was someone else's job to maintain it and take care of it. It was- Clean it yeah. and everything. Why am I here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mike, you'll get your chance. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. But no, very well said. So uh, anyway, I thought it would be great to have Mike on the show. There's all kinds of things and, and ideas uh, that you may not have thought about of how you could use a charter boat, even if you own your own boat. Yeah, very true. So uh, very, very anyway, true. with that, I'm going to shut up and turn it over to Mike. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I returned Monday, I guess it was, from boating too. Um, I'll, I'll cry the blues, but then I, I'll, I'll win your hearts back. It, we left with a broken windlass. We were going to go to Friday Harbor for a night, then Susha for a night, and we had... Uh, myself and my wife, my two younger brothers and their wives, and my brother and sister-in-law. So the plan was we're going to have to pull the anchor up in Susha. And they're all my age, and I'm like, I'm not looking forward to this. <laughs> so when we got up to Susha on Saturday afternoon, there was not a single boat on the linear dock system. So rather than anchor, we pulled into that tied up there and spent two nights at Susha because it was just so nice. It was peaceful. We had a great time. Um, glad to be back to work. Um, Do we have the, uh, were we able great, to get Mike's slides? Great question, Mark. The beauty of live television here. So uh, Mike and Mark, we've got Katie McPhail in the back of the go. house, oh, twisting the dials, making us look this good is, like she always does. So uh, she's going to be holding our hand as we go through this uh, with you spotlighted, uh, Mike. Yeah, some, some of these will maybe gloss through, but this is a presentation that, that I've done at the Seattle Boat Show a few times. Um, so yeah, the, the first cover slide here. And of course, Yacht Charter has been around since 1979. Um, you can actually, I think if you go to the next slide, it talks a little bit about the history. Uh, um, it doesn't talk in this slide about the original owners, but originally, um, and of course, Yacht Charter was started by Jim and Lois Shea. So from the beginning of time, AYC was a family-owned company. Jim and Lois's kids worked there. Um, and, and so they ran the business for 10 years. And about the time they were ready to sell, my father-in-law, who you see in the picture, my mother, my mother and father-in-law, Dan and Sherry Meyer, they were looking to make a change. Both their daughters had graduated high school and were off in college. And Dan had been the pool director and the swim team coach. So kind of dealing with public funding and stuff, he wanted to get away from that and, and find something to do his own business. So they happened to have the same accounting, um, accountant, excuse me, the Shays and my mother and father-in-law. And the accountant put the two of them together and Eventually, they negotiated a deal, and Dan and Sherry bought the business from the Shays in 1989. I came along in uh, 1990. Kristen and I met oh, a couple of years prior to that, but we got married in 1990. Uh, Kristen was uh, a CPA, and I was building boats at Sea Sport Boats at the time. And I spent 10 years building boats for for the rights at Seasport. I had a great time there. It was a great company to work for. Um, about the time, well, 10 years later, it was like, we're thinking about having kids. Kristen has a CPA. It's not real conducive to raising a family and me working at Seasport. It was time to make a change. And 
I had been asked to join the family business. Kristen, I was always worked there, work in the books. And so in 1997, I joined the business and all the fears that I may or may not have had of going to work for my father-in-law were allayed in an instant. My, my father-in-law was a, a wonderful mentor to me and, and, and really taught me everything I needed to know about the business. And, and, and I wouldn't have been nearly as successful as Kristen and I would have if, if it hadn't been for him. So very blessed. So in 2005, um, Dan and Sherry decided that it was time to think about retiring. So we negotiated a deal and Kristen and I um, agreed to purchase the company. And last May, uh, we paid it off. So you're now, so, the buck stops yeah, with you. So the buck, well, yeah, the buck stops with my wife and I, really. <laughs> but yes, yes, very true. Um, so really, I mean, in a nutshell, that's the, the history of AYC. I think what's important to me kind of in this slide is it kind of represents the, the, from the beginning of the time, AYC has been a family business, right? And, and, and everything we do, whether it's how we treat employees or how we work with our charter customers or how we work with our boat owners, it's all about relationships. I mean, you guys know you're in the marine industry. Everything in this business is about relationships. And, and that's how we try and run it. It's very, very important to us. I think, you know, that's how we keep some of the staff for as long as we do. And that's why we have as many repeat customers as we do. And it's, it, it's been very important to us. So, um, And what was it like this year? How did COVID affect your business? Oh, my gosh. Well, you really have to go back to the beginning of COVID. So when, people cancel their yeah. charters. So, well, when COVID hit and everybody was ordered to stay home, right? We had to send everybody home. Yeah. So it, it was Kristen and I in the office answering the phones and we were able to keep the service department there because they're servicing boats and they were considered essential. Um, and obviously Chris and I own the business so we could be there to try and fight the fires. Every phone call was a cancellation and we're pulling our hair out. What are we going to do? Um, but slowly the worm turned and by June, well, actually before that, even, even before things started lifting and the islands were still getting, were still closed, excuse me. We're getting phone calls from people that are, they've been shut in at home long enough. They just want to go do something. So they want to go out on a boat for a long weekend and, and they'll just go park in the harbor. They won't go ashore. They know they can't, whatever. It was, I mean, we didn't get a lot of it, but there was a surprising amount of it, more than we've ever got before. And then the classes got really popular. And then we questioned, should we be doing classes? It's too many people, but we worked it out. Everybody wore masks and we slept. It, it all worked out, but peep, there was demand. By the time the stay at home mandate was lifted, the phone started ringing in the other way. We all, everybody that had, well, everybody that lives locally, right? That, that, that travels, they're not gonna travel abroad. You can't go to Canada. What else are we gonna do? We like to boat, we're a boater. We boat, we go on a boat, boating vacation, maybe one out of five years. And the rest of the time we go to Europe, we do this, we do that. Well, we have no other choice. Let's go boating. Yeah. By the end of that year, we had a better year than we had had the previous year. And this year, oh my gosh, we, we had a, back when Dan and Sherry owned the company, the dynamics of the fleet were a little different. You had more boats. There were times they had 110 boats, but it was a lot of smaller boats and not very many big boats. So they're doing 700 charters a summer. Since Kristen and I have owned it, we kind of took over right before the big recession in 2008 and things really changed for us. But the dynamic of the fleet changed too. We went from a lot of smaller boats to you know, quite a few big boats. Well, you, they rent for more money. So you're, you're doing more charter or less charter, excuse me, for more money. So in the end, it all works out. So this year for the first time in 11 years, we, we served over 500 charters. It, it had been pretty steadily in the 250 to 350 range for the last 10, 11 years. So yeah, the demand is there. It's, it's incredible. That's astounding. We need getting those people out the door. Frankly, we need boats. <laughs> uh, 
20 boats. Well, we'll talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there's an opportunity yeah. for people who own boats. And yes. Go to the next slide. Please. Oh, sorry. Yes. That's okay. I'm just jabbering, not following the slides. I, this kind of talks a little bit more about the different divisions and stuff we do at AYC. I don't know if it's really re yeah, relevant to what we're talking slide. about tonight. What we offer, um, yeah, we are primar primarily a bare boat charter company. We can do skippered stuff. Um, we don't like to do anything less than a four day, uh, yeah, four day, three night charter. Um, or, a, but we are flexible. I mean, things have have changed. In the, in the prime season, we like to keep it as much as we can to week-long charters, you know, that the July, August time frame. But even then, you know, we'll, we have flexibility. We do have, a, well, charter yacht ownership. Obviously, all the boats in the fleet are privately owned, so we don't own our own boats, and we work with all of our owners, and there are advantages to having a boat and charter, which we can get into later. We do have a ASA certified sailing school, and we teach a... RPBA power school. And we usually do the classes in the in the fall, in the spring, kind of outside our busier time. It it's good in a couple of ways. It, it it provides a little additional revenue to boats in a part of the year that we don't have a lot of charter activity. Um, so that's good for the boat owners. Um, well, that's probably the primary reason, really. Yeah. Next, um, next slide. Range of charting, yeah, we have sail powered. We we do man or broker some crude boats. So we have, actually, we do have a, a couple of crude boats. Um, we do some day rental stuff. And every year, it seems like we work out a couple of one-way trips. So not everybody can break away for eight weeks to do a round trip to Alaska and back, right? But maybe they can do four weeks and take it up and we match them up with somebody who can pick the boat up on the other end and do four weeks and bring it back. So when talk about one bay, one way bear boats, that's what that's about. Yep, next slide. The character of Anna Korsha, it, we, I kind of touched about this a little bit with the whole relationship thing, but customers trust AYC to deliver an amazing experience. Funny story, I mean, that kind of, addresses that right there. We were we were in a management meeting, I don't know, probably 10 years ago now. And my wife says, I want to do something. And I'm like, okay, well, what do you want to do? And she says, well, I want to do, I want to hire some people in the summer that are just customer service people. All they do is take people's luggage to the boat, take their luggage off the boat at the end of the trip. And, and I'm like, that's insane. We can't do that. The, the amount of overhead that we would pay to these people that are going to sit around for part of the day and on a I don't know if we can do that. Well, of course, I don't win these arguments, which is fine, because of course it was the best thing we ever did at AYC. The the customers love it. It they're so appreciative, and I'm like, well, see, there you go. And and we do try and take care of the people. I mean, we have a a, a shuttle van that will take people to the grocery store. Um, it's it's really important. It's all about customer service. Yep. Next slide. 40 years ago, yeah, it, you know, one thing we haven't talked about, Mark mentioned that that uh, the Pacific Northwest is the, the largest um, charter area, has the most, the, the largest number of boats condensed in an area, well, second most really. Um, Anagor's yacht charters for the longest time has been, and I believe it's still true to this day, the single largest bare boat charter company in the continental United States. We have more boats under one company name than anyone. And I think this slide kind of talks a lot about that. We don't, we don't do this if we don't take care of our boat owners, we don't take care of our charter customers and, and, and take care of our staff. So yeah, we do, we try and do a really good job. And I think I Nobody's think that last perfect. slide covers it. <laughs> yeah. You make it hassle-free. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we try to. Yeah. We really do. Yeah. Yeah. Next slide. There we go. That's, you know, it's kind of more of the same. We do actually, one of the things I'll talk about there is uh, the query. Customers 
well, it's actually not what they're talking about, but we do send a survey home with every customer at the end of their trip. It meets them when they get home. And, and every one of those customer surveys that comes back to us goes to every member of the management team. And we keep them in a folder. And at the end of the year, we go through all of those customer sur or surveys with each individual boat owner on their own boat and what the surveys were. Really, you know, it, it really helps all of us appreciate the little things we need to pay attention to on each little boat to make a customer happy. Uh, the details. More of the details. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one thing that's maybe important there that, well, there are a few, I guess we can talk about um, the reservation staff. We're, we're very blessed. I mean, Christine, who's been with us for more than 10 years, has been in the charter industry for more than 20 years. She's a She's a godsend, um, and you know we have Susan who's been with us for more than three or no more than ten. Excuse me. We had a couple of people leave this year, so we are hiring a couple of new people. But our reservations team is great. Um, the customer service experience and all the extras. And, I think one of the things that's important is the the briefing. And I think you use the Wagner guides for your briefing. We do. And you put them on every boat. We Sorry, I just every, had to, we do I just had to every work, boat. work that into this. Yes, that. and they are mentioned in the briefing. <laughs> Peter um, normally rings a bell if we make a uh, uh, <laughs> listed as, uh, mention of the Wagner guide. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> next slide. <laughs> oh, wait, wait. Back up. What, what's the four hour guarantee? Yeah, so I, I knew someone would catch that. <laughs> so, it, it, a lot of years ago now, we were um, marketing partners with the Moorings, and it was a really cool experience. So we got to go to the Moorings, and, and we picked up a few things there when we were there. And, and we actually, I was proud of the fact that they were really, when they came to visit us, they thought our office briefing was something, oh, my God, and they started doing that. But what we picked up from them was this four-hour guarantee. If you have a breakdown and we can't get a service within four hours, you're, we're on the clock towards compensating you. We're not gonna try, we're never gonna stop trying to fix the problem, but if we can't do it in four hours, you're gonna get compensated <coughs> for downtime because I mean, you're and on I, vacation. I've heard stories where you've swapped boats. Oh yeah. Well, well run a different boat out to people to solve that problem. We, we, we don't ever wanna do that, but we will do whatever we humanly can possible to salvage a vacation. We had a, we had a customer this year and again, it's so busy we don't have boats sitting around waiting to go if something breaks down. So we had a couple this year that the boat they were on, I think unfortunately had gone aground, so it was just not available. And all we could do was split their time between two sailboats. And they were originally on a power boat. Fortunately, they had a history as sailors. And it was so funny because my oldest son, Mitchell and I took, uh, Third, no, we took a 42 foot Moody out to them and they were getting off a 36 foot Bavaria. And they had had the time of their lives and the boat that we took to them was Great like boat. a carbon, carbon copy of the boat that they had owned for 10 years. And they're wow. like, oh my God, this is the greatest thing ever. So, you know, not every, it, it takes the customers being understanding and appreciative of the situation, but everybody's just been great and these people were great and i hate we hate affecting people's vacation right, right. that's the way to do it you know so mike can you walk us through a typical uh going taking your customer through the boat i assume it's different for the experienced boater versus a new boater and what yeah great question offer. so you know even even before and this this topic's important for both the charter customer, I guess, and, and a potential prospective boat owner. So the process is someone calls and they want to rent a boat. So the, the reservations team gets on the phone and will kind of help based on, you know, the number of people that they're bringing, what their boating background is, what they have experience with in the past, and kind of help steer them in a direction and, and say, okay, here, here are some boats that I think would work for you. Why don't you take a look? And once they decide on a boat, they book the reservation, we send them a packet of information included in which is a boating experience resume. We ask them to fill it out, send it back to us. Marcus Abbott, who's our general manager, he reviews those, 
based on what's there, they either get approved because obviously they have a lot of experience and they're gonna be more than comfortable on this boat, or maybe they're not quite there and there's a few things that we can recommend them do. Um, I know sometimes you'll send somebody out with them yes. for the first day. They might go to Friday Harbor yep. and then that instructor or person who's briefer gets on the ferry and comes back. Yep, once the instructor and the, the charter customer are comfortable, they can drop the, the, the skipper off at the ferry landing and they ferry home and the customer continues on the rest of vacation. That's what we call a cruising one. Yeah. 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 And there's other things like, let's say somebody has a lot of experience on 36 foot sailboats, but now they're bringing more people with them and they want to rent a 50 foot sailboat. It, my comfort level is about eight feet. So they're a little bit beyond that. So we would ask them to do what we call a prequal. And it's ideal if they live local, but it works either way. If they live local, they come up in the spring and we put them on the boat they're supposed to take with one of our fleet captains and we do some close quarters maneuvering practice so they get comfortable with the boat. Uh, that way, when they come out in the summer, they're ready to go. They already know how the boat handles, what the prop walk does, and, and, and they're they're gonna be more prepared to have a good time. Um, but yeah, then if it takes more than that, we can do what we call additional instruction and spend up to three hours with them that evening, the, the day their charter starts, just to get them to the point where they're comfortable docking the boat. Most important thing for us is, is that. I mean, it's, it's very rare to see someone come through our doors that doesn't have experience with navigation and boats and boat handling and reading tides and tide books. Um, but it's the close quarters maneuvering on a boat you're not familiar with, right? Next slide. Do you, Mike, do, you, do your uh, charters, your customers, are they, do, are you, do you have to be multilingual or are, are language issues an, an issue for you? I, I suppose, unfortunately for us, it has never been an issue, no. No. We, if you look at uh, the marketing dynamics of, of our customer base, it's it's probably 90 percent united states probably 80 75 percent west coast another 10 to 15 percent comes out of the the what the obvious places the gulf states where boating's popular or the you know po points in the east coast where boating's popular um and then a few people internationally, not a lot. Interesting. Yeah. It's so, yeah. So you've got a great fleet. We have a great fleet. You have a fantastic fleet. People can look on the website. It's kind of interesting to see the boats they have. It's, it is. I mean, we're the thing that's inter interesting about the fleet and, and different from someone say like the moorings or sun sail, you know, all, all of our boats are privately owned. So we, I don't want to, it makes it sound bad to say we are at the mercy, but that, I guess that's the best way to say it. Whatever an owner brings to us is, is what we're left to be able to market. Um, and that's a real different conversation with an owner of a, of a very unique boat, maybe that isn't going to be real popular in charter versus a boat that will be real in charter, popular in charter. Yep. Next slide. The four hour guaranteed. So what is covered, engines, transmission, windless charging. And, and again, what we will do, correct the problem within four hours. And uh, if not compensation based by uh, based upon actual time loss, less the four hour grace period. The only thing we ask the customer to do is call us. We have an hour after hours paging system that will, well, it'll call through Oh, three, three different people in our service staff and, and it won't stop calling people until we call in and listen to the message. So there is 24 hours assistance. Um, yeah, but during business hours, they call the office, they're gonna get responded to right away and, and we'll get someone on it. We have a lot of vendors out in the islands in, in different places. So, you know, if you're in Friday Harbor or Roach Harbor or Deer Harbor, or one of those places, it's, it's usually pretty easy to get hold of someone who we've built that relationship with and, and get them to come down to the boat pretty quickly and, and at least troubleshoot what we're looking at. Next slide. Uh, this is just a list of 
stuff that we provide to the charters. Um, it's pretty standard, uh, you know. But not all. everybody does this. I'll point that out. Not different things. Not, not everybody. Yeah. Does. I mean, but yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. it's fine. I, the captains club and the admirals club, we we offer the loyalty problem or loyalty programs to people. Uh, if you're a cap, you're a captain if you've chartered uh, two years in a row, and an admiral if you've chartered with us five times or more. And it gives you some perks. Um, I, I want to be careful what I say here because I think with COVID, we may have changed some of this stuff this year. But in previous year, if you're an admiral, we'd refuel the boat and pump it out for you. Um, you'd pay for the fuel, but the labor was covered. Um, you get uh, discounts up front for uh, off your charter. And, uh, you know, there are some, it's, it's a good deal. Loyalty program it's, it's a good deal to be an admiral. Yep. Next slide. Um, our loyalty members are our best asset. It's true, close to 50%. I actually think it's a little more than that, to be honest with you. Um, have chartered with us before. Um, in 2014, we have charters returning who have chartered with us 20 times. Um, yeah, there are there are a few. Um, yeah, and half the charters in any year were referred to us by family or friends and had prior knowledge. It, it, it is, it's true. Um, there's a ton of loyalty amongst uh, our, our charter customers and our boat owners. Yep. Um, we have boat owners that have owned two, three different boats in the fleet. Next slide. Uh, how does AYC consistently stay on top of its industry? Yeah, well, through marketing. And quality. Yeah. It, you consistently deliver quality. Really, more importantly, that's it. Because from a marketing standpoint, I mean, we don't look like the most tech savvy company out there. We don't have the flashiest website or whatever, but it's what we do every day that brings people back. Yep. Yeah. So Mike, if, if most of the boats are privately owned, how do you handle the routine maintenance between you and the owner? It's a good question. Every owner's different, right? So you have owners that want to exist within the fleet and, and be very much in control of what's happening in their boats. We, we have had, I don't think we have anybody doing it now, but we've had owners in the fleet that, that do their own checkouts, their own check-ins and clean their own boats and do all, their, all the turnaround service on their boats. In the past, we've had people do that. And as long as it doesn't become a problem between the boat owner and a charter customer, I'm happy to have them do it. Who better to be the checkout skipper for a boat than the boat owner? Um, and then you have other owners that, that you know, I just, you guys take care of the boat, whatever you need to do, just take care of it. And so it's, it's all across the board. And so how you handle it is you, you unfortunately it, it takes a little time, but you identify how each individual owner wants to be involved, involved and part of the fleet. Thank you. And, and you do your best to make sure you're treating them the way they want to be treated this year for the first year ever. Um, we kind of got lucky and had two people apply for the service manager position that we really wanted. So we hired them both thinking that that will allow us to communicate with our boat owners better and knowing that each boat owner might not get along with this individual personality. Well, if they don't get along with this guy, maybe we can try them over here with this guy and get a better fit. Yeah, I mean, we try, I mean, at the end of the day, as much as I, we all try, I, I'm not going to lie, there have been failures. There, there have been cases where I have not made someone happy and they've left the fleet. But honestly, it's pretty few and far between. Fantastic. Next slide. So we have some testimonials here. Right. They're also on the website, so you can take a look at them there. Yeah, it's um, good stuff. Yeah, you can, you can go to the next one. Uh, and it, we don't, I don't know what time it is, but the next several slides kind of go through. I mean, okay, go to the next one. It kind of goes through, like, this is when a car, charter customer arrives. We have this tent out here and we have customer service staff that will receive their luggage and we'll hold it under the tent while they're going through the checkout and all that. Next slide. That's the front counter at the office and a little reader board that we put outside the door. I uh, go to the next one. There's really only one in here I kind of wanted to 
talk about. Um, go ahead and go to the next one. That shows you the charter package. Go to the next one. Uh, this is the one. So there's me, much, much younger. And we don't do this as often anymore, but I used to do live briefings for almost every checkout. And it, it got to the point where we're doing checkouts at 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock, and then a floor, 4 o'clock checkout. And I spent four hours in the briefing room every day and don't know what's going on in the office. So we, I don't do this. Anymore. About 15 years ago or whatever it is, um, we did a video of, of me doing this, and now everybody gets to watch me on video. Anyway, th th funny story. Um, and just a few more pictures of, you know, what they do going through the boat. Oh, the, the one, you, you can probably skip through to the end. There's really a lot of the rest of it is, is fluff. You know, the things we offer to people and, and uh, so my put birdies on every boat. In home. If I, I own a boat, what, what do I, what's the advantages to me as a boat owner putting my boat in the AYC program. I know there's tax advantages. You can talk about that. I love the idea that somebody else is gonna manage it and maintain it. And uh, if it's not booked, it's available. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, in a nutshell, and, and this is gonna vary from boat to boat, but does it make sense for you to own your boat for 70 cents on the dollar, or excuse me, 30 cents on the dollar? Um, and still get to use it as much as you would typically any other year. I mean, we're talking about a 20 to 24 week charter season of which we're chartering, well, this year's an extreme year. So let's say 10 to 12 weeks on a really busy or on a pretty busy boat. Well, that that's still allowing a lot of time for the owner to use their boat. Um, if you're getting 12 weeks of charter, well, you're getting more than a 70% return. You're going to get more in the 90% and maybe even come close to break even, depending on what you bought the, bought the boat for. So this year is kind of an extreme example. But in general, for the last 10 years, I've been telling people, okay, so you buy the boat for the right price. We market it. We put eight weeks of charter on your boat, and you're going to pay for 70% of what it costs you on the boat. Mortgage, maintenance, insurance, principal and interest on a boat loan. We'll pay for 70% of that with eight weeks. So why is that a bad deal? On top of it, especially if you don't live local, like in Anacortes, um, there's You're somebody there every the day watching your boat. Yeah. You can't make it up because the power's out and the snowstorm hits. You know, someone's at AYC there to make sure yeah. your boat's getting taken care of. Yeah. Um, so it takes away the headaches of it, owning a yeah, boat. It, it does. When... A, this is something that we don't promote a lot when we should, but we do the same thing for our boat owners as we do for our charter customers. You know, when a boat owner shows up, the boat's going to, should be ready to go. When they come in, you know, there's chartered, um, there's customer service staff available for them. When the boat comes in, you know, especially if they're, well, if they're part of the, um, no, 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 that would be, that's a charter customer, that's a charter, but a boat owner is part of the, um, auto pay program. So they leave a credit card and file, right? They don't, they don't clean the boat when they come back. They don't pump it out. None of that stuff. We'll do all that for them. We'll do the linens. Wow. Yeah. That makes owning right. a boat much easier. And talk about the tax advantages. I, I know that sales tax when you buy a boat is huge. So it's important. You have to make the decision before you buy the boat. But yeah, if you do, Claire, at the time of purchase, that your boat will go into charter service with a managed program like Anacortes Yacht Charters or one of the others. Right. Um, you can then defer sales tax on the purchase price of the boat. So, you know, a hundred thousand boat dollar boat, you're going to defer ninety two hundred dollars. Yeah. Well, a million dollar boat, you're going to defer ninety two thousand dollars. Right. Um, there are caveats that go with that, though, that each boat owner has to understand. You defer sales tax, the Department of Revenue says you as the boat owner are allowed zero personal pleasure use of your boat. You can use your boat for fun, but you have to play by the Department of Revenue's rules, which are you have to charter it back from yourself. So basically you pay the going rate for the boat. I can't tell the boat owner, well, I'll give you this wink, wink, nudge, nudge deal where you pay $5 for the week when the regular customers are paying 10 grand. 
But what the Department of Revenue does allow us to do is adjust our commission split. As long as we show profit motive as a company, we can adjust our commission split. So for a boat owner, we make it as palatable as we can. The Department of Revenue said we can reduce it to 5%. So basically a boat owner pays 5% of the weekly charter rate and sales tax on that number. So let's say the boat chartered for $10,000 a week, they would pay what, 920 bucks in sales tax and $500 in commissions. Still a lot less. Yeah, well, when you figure, that. So, so what I tell a boat owner, right, if you're deferring $92,000, how many times do you have to rent the boat for, what did we just say, uh, uh, 1500 bucks yeah. to get to $92,000? Now, the, only, the other catch is if the boat ever comes out of charter, you are then, as, as long as it stays in the state of Washington and is used for private use, if it doesn't go into another charter company, you're then due... The, the Washington state's gonna come after you for the sales tax on the fair market value of the boat at that current time. So one of the other things that I like about chartering is it, I, I have a small boat. I've told people on the show before, I have a 30 foot tally craft, uh, one cabin for sleeping. And I have friends call me up and go, hey, can I go boating with you? Yes. And I offer them two choices. Either we split the cost of a larger boat, a charter, yep. or uh, or they charter their own boat, buddy boat. boat with us. There you go. And that typically has been a great way to deal with that. Yeah. Because no, uh, I, I have other other people that I know say, well, I, 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 we're, we just had grandchildren. We need a bigger boat to handle the grandchildren. Yeah, no, that's a great example. Charter it yeah. for the one week the grandkids <laughs> are going to be on the boat. <laughs> you don't necessarily have to go buy a bigger boat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe rent one for a little while. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go on vacation. For so I, I think it gives us all, even if you're a boat owner, some additional flexibility of what you can do. No, it's 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 pretty crazy. I mean, over the years, you know, all, we talk in some of the slides about how some of the charter customers have have rented us from us for for twenty, 20 years. years. Yeah. We have we have a boat owner that's now owned a boat with us for probably almost five, maybe even longer than that. But before that, they chartered for 10 years from us. Yeah. And I think they're talking about now moving to Anacortes. We have another boat owner who's, who's been in charter with us for 20 years and just bought a house here. Hmm. And they, they were from the Bay Area. Uh, yeah, it's... I also know... Mike, I got, Mike, I have a question. Do you write... Your boats are the boats that are chartered out. Are they? Are there certain navigation areas that they're allowed to go into? Is it just uh, the Washington question. waters, or is it BC, or what's the limits? Great question. So, from an insurance standpoint, we're covered inside Vancouver Island. Um, so you can't go out on the west side. You can, and I'll get to it in a minute. There's a way to do it, but coverage without getting a rider is inside Vancouver Island as far as the northern tip, so 51 degrees or whatever. So anywhere in there, you're fine. Um, if you wanna go to Alaska or you wanna go say out on the west side, all we have to do is uh, provide our insurance broker with a resume and a float plan. It doesn't, there's no additional charge for it and, and they'll approve it and you can go on your trip. Yeah. Um, the only other thing with navigation limits, and because we're a bare boat charter company, we can't really tell people where they can and can't go. But yeah, I'm, Mark, I think you're a big part of that little safety chart we have. Uh oh. Uh oh. I'll get that. Um, you keep talking. So we have this white, what we call a safety chart with all these red marks all over it. So our, uh, way back when we were chartering, I. Right? I think I recall that uh, there were limitations too. There was no movement at night, so no uh, no motoring or sailing at night. Or is that still well? Okay? Yes, true. There, there, you know, we don't want you out there in limited visibility. We want you going at night, and those were really insurance limitations. Um, you know, again, technically, I can't tell anybody what to do because we're bare boat. The Jones Act comes into play there. So yeah. It's, but from an insurance standpoint, I mean, you got to understand, okay, you, you, as the skipper of the boat, you can do what you want. You got to realize though, you're doing it with no insurance. So it's a risk. 
One other question. So COVID related, uh, did you did you have to change any of your procedures for cleaning on uh, preparing the boats for the next next uh, charter? I mean, other than maybe using more disinfectant? No, I mean, the boats have always been, I mean, cleanliness is, is, is the um, single easiest way to start off a charter on the wrong foot. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, it's always been a huge part of what we do. But yeah, I mean, you know, obviously it was emphasized with the staff at the preseason that this is serious. We need to, you know, wear protective clothing. We need to use the, the disinfectants and this is not a joke. Um, other than that, no, not really. I mean, the mask policies and those kind of things. I'm, I've been somewhat surprised that, that, you know, the customers really haven't had a problem with it. It really hasn't been a concern or a question, which surprises me to a degree. Other questions? How are we doing on time? Am I talking we, too much? No, you're you're talking just fine. We're just about. I'm I'm just checking for questions so we can begin to wrap it up, and uh, people can get on those phones and be calling uh, <laughs> reservations agents at uh, Anaconda Anacor Job Charters for next season. Uh, you uh, do have people the only, reserving already for the, next. Season. The only caveat there. Let's see. Tomorrow's Friday. Tomorrow's going to be a busy check. Call Monday. <laughs> this is going to be a crazy busy weekend. We have we have two or more, you know, two or three more really busy weekends, and it'll start to calm down a bit. So, and that's an important point. You've got people chartering now right through the oh, fall. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I know some of your all weather boats right through the winter. They're they're being reserved. Yeah, it's it's funny. I was talking to. Okay, I shouldn't even say this, but you know, I told you our son's moving to Maui. Yeah. Well, He's staying at the timeshare. They called me. So this gal from the timeshare is talking to me all about chartering a boat next month. Okay. <laughs> you called me to talk about a reservation at the timeshare. How did we get on? She said, and a quarter I'm like, all right, this one. It's, it, so yeah, the demand is there. Um, it's, it's funny. And, and we will, I'm, I'm going to guess by the end of November, unless we pick up a lot of boats, we'll be 40% booked for 2022. Wow. It's amazing. What That's a story. Good. Congratulations, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, well, we're going to, on that happy note. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, that's a prediction. I don't know this, but it, it would surprise me. I, I, I think, agree. I think all of us in the boating industry have, have probably another year or two of, of this kind of boom that we feel oh, yeah, because of people's reluctance to travel abroad right. and all this other stuff. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think so. I hope so. Well, thank, yeah. thank you so much, Mike. Um, hey, man, is, do you want to preview next week's show? Thank you. Thank you. You go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> we have Malcolm Harker next week. He is British uh, engineer. He comes from a very distinguished family dating back to 1800s, uh, the Harker Engineering Company that's uh, no longer in business to date, uh, but a long history, interesting family history, as well as the vessel itself. He took a British fireboat oh. called... Uh, um, so. Uh, right now it's called SEB, S-S-S-E-B, and uh, he converted a uh, fireboat into a uh, pleasure craft, and it's fascinating how he did that. The, the vessel still has some of its original pieces and parts. Uh, fascinating story about how he did it, uh, history about the boat, as well as his own uh, family history. A boat is really interesting. I've been aboard it. And uh, it'll be an interesting show uh, and his story. And also he's got a British accent, which I think he'll be better on the show than the rest of us. It just Ouch. The makes it more critical. Uh, we were going to send Peter off to British land, uh, accent school. But, uh, it got cut out of the budget. Fair enough. Yeah, I think a British accent adds about 15 IQ points. 
It does. It does. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks, Landon. Thank Mark. Thank thank you, Mark, for for putting together today's show. And I want to thank everyone at home. And looking forward to seeing you all next Thursday. You know, the NFL they had to put up the uh, the schedule against us. They tried to take us on, Mark, but we'll see how we did. We got a nice show tonight. So thank you so much. Good. Thank you, everybody. Good night. We'll see you next week. Well, good afternoon, Kevin Carlton here, Harbor Master of Roach Harbor. Welcome. Talk to you a little bit today about the color ceremony of needs to be done on charters. Right. And I, I'm disappointed that Josie hasn't. Our Roach Harbor Resort. You know, it's for me. Our color every time I do it, like, why don't I do by this? By the late Ruben um, Hart founder of Roach Harbor as a resort in while 1956 ago now, a, for the first color ceremony going off in 1957. Our color staff uh, consists of four to five dock staff that they'll march out to Colonel Bogey's March to the flags uh, where they promptly take down the Roach Harbor Burgee first and then they'll take down the Washington State flag and then take down the Canadian flag, and then followed last by the British flag, and then the American flag comes down with a salute to colors by a cannon, and then it plays taps. In Roach Harbor, please come and join us for our time honored celebration. We look forward to sharing this experience with all of the boaters here at Roach Harbor and have a safe and happy boating season.